Hi, and welcome to Code Break. My name is Hadi. There are thousands of people who are joining us across Zoom, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live, and together we're hoping to build the world's largest live interactive classroom. With so many students at home, my team at Code.org invites families everywhere to join us for a weekly dose of inspiration, community, and computer science. I'd like to start by introducing our first special guest this week, YouTube CEO, Susan Wojcicki. Susan, are you there with us? Hi, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you okay. Uh, the video is a can little you see bit. see me? Yep, we can see you just <laughs> fine. And I'm here sort with Sort of. My... Yep, Hello. Um, hello. This is my daughter, Sophia. Uh, she's my sidekick on Codebreak, and she's also a budding computer scientist. <sighs> Great. We need more computer scientists. We, we definitely do, especially young women like Sophia. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to start this week's episode by addressing the events of the last week in the United States. Uh, this has been something that's on all of our minds. Uh, at a time of a global pandemic, it really has pained me and all of us to, to see racism grip the United States and cause so much suffering, especially among Black communities. Code.org stands together with the Black community, our employees, partners, teachers, and their students in the fight against systemic inequity, racism, and injustice in the United States. We thank all the teachers who strive for equity in their classrooms, who show empathy to a nation that needs healing, and who work daily to support the next generation to build a better future. We all also know equity is broader than what happens in the classroom, and opportunity can't be found when racism remains unaddressed in our world. Uh, Susan, I also know YouTube put out a similar statement uh, just a few days ago, uh, and I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to yeah. that, but we want to go ahead. No, definitely. We, we were devastated to see those horrible acts of, of racial injustice. And we want to make sure that everyone in our society can feel safe. And uh, it was devastating for us to see. And so we made a lot of statements on the YouTube platform to make sure that we used our platform to stand up, um, stand up against racial injustice and speak up um, for what we think is right, which is bringing everyone together and enabling everyone to be safe. And we are, um, well, A, we're making a donation um, to a group that does a lot of work in this area and also using our platform to make sure that we can bring different voices together um, to process all the information and make sure that we can make sure that all the black voices that uh, have so much to say and this, uh, others who really wanna chime in uh, and talk about the, the challenges of uh, um, injustice in our society are able to voice their points of view and and bring us all together for a better world so that everybody can feel safe and we're, we're going to continue to do what we can and um, and it's a it's a very tough situation so um, I'm glad Hadi that you brought this up at the very beginning um, and that that we can address it for everybody so we would usually start our episodes with a computer science joke of the day, but instead of doing that, what we want to do instead is to stand in solidarity with all the victims of racism in the United States. I want to ask, including those at home who are on mute or not on the camera, to join me in a moment of silence to reflect on how we can all individually help make our world a better place. Uh, and Susan, uh, if you don't see everybody's faces, if you click the little button that looks like this in the right-hand side of your screen, uh, that, that would help. And if we could go to gallery view so everybody else at home sees all the faces on the screen, uh, that would be great. And we'll start a brief moment of silence. All right, having spent that time, uh, I wanna have us all first meet our live audience. We have a few dozen students on camera. Could we all unmute? Uh, Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 Go back to mute and uh, Susan, that's the sort of folks that you can see on camera, but there's most of the people on this call actually aren't on camera. 
to show you where our audience is calling from uh, as everybody was joining in. Uh, here's a map of where people are calling from. There's a few people who fake their locations coming from Antarctica. Uh, but as you can tell, people are calling in not only from all over the country, but all over the world, all sorts of different time zones from Africa, from East Asia, uh, from Hawaii. It's, for some of the folks, it's at 7 a.m. their time. For some folks, it's 1 a.m. their time, uh, which is pretty incredible. Uh, as we go through this episode, if folks have questions for Susan, you can submit them online. You can go to code.org slash questions and we'll have a chance to, to ask your questions of Susan. I know every single person who's on this call is a user of YouTube and you might have interesting questions. Uh, today, we're gonna learn about abstraction, which is one of the most important concepts of computer science. And we're gonna have three parts unplugged. We're gonna learn about functions and we're gonna learn about libraries. Uh, but first, I want to start with a few questions for Susan. Um, I'm going to ask some questions, and then some of our students have questions as well. Susan, you were there at the very, very beginning of Google. It, in fact, it started in your own garage. Can you share a little bit about the experience of having a company as important and significant as Google <laughs> start in your garage? Sure. Sure. Well, it started because I knew the two founders of Google, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, when we were all just friends. No one had started any companies. And I had just bought a house and houses are expensive and I wanted to have someone help us pay the rent. And so they had just started Google and they were having a hard time finding office space. And so we just agreed, why don't you just move in? You can rent from our garage. It's and actually they entered through the garage, but they had a few rooms in the house too. And they got up to about seven employees. And uh, it was pretty funny having a company in your house. And at the time it actually was pretty convenient because we got really good internet service. Uh, and that was a big benefit for us. But we had a few issues late at night because they would stay there all night working. And of course, we wanted to go to bed. And sometimes they were making a lot of noise. But uh, overall, it was, uh, it, was, it was pretty fun to have them there in our house. And when they got up to about seven people, we both agreed that it was a little too crowded. It was not a big house. It's a pretty small house. And uh, we shared it with them. But... I think what it shows is that big ideas can come from young people. And Sergey and Larry at the time were still in school. They were um, in their early 20s. And um, young people have a lot of really good ideas. And they saw this opportunity. And I think the reason it's relevant here is because we have a lot of young people. And you probably are seeing opportunities that no one else is seeing because our world is changing so much. And that's an opportunity for you to be able to seize that. Um, and learning how to code and learning how to build these um, technologies will enable you to do a lot of, um, open up a lot of opportunities, just like it did for Sergey and Larry. So um, it was, it was, it's sort of funny now because Google is such a big company. And at the time, it seemed really normal to have them there working in our house. Sophia's hoping to start a company to sell soap. Uh, maybe she'll be doing that in our garage as well. Probably not. Um, so we have some student questions, uh, and there's a bunch of these, uh, so let's try to get to them quickly. So we have Kalkidan from Maryland. Uh, if we could unmute her, and Kalkidan, can you ask your question? What was the first YouTube video did you, that you watched? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so I, I, I think I could answer that in two ways. So we at Google started a, a, vi a video service similar to Google, similar to YouTube. And at the time we had something called Google video where we just enabled people to upload videos. And um, the very, very first video I ever watched of just uploaded from people from the internet was this video of these puppets that were purple and they were singing in a really, in a language I had no idea. I think it was some kind of like Swedish or Danish. And I thought it was the weirdest thing I had ever seen. And I wasn't sure what to think. And I actually had my kids with me and they looked at it. We were all really silent after it ended. And then they all started laughing and they wanted to see it again. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And then there was another video once we built Google video that was really our first hit, which were these two students that were singing to the Backstreet Boys in their dorm room. And they actually had 
their roommate in the background doing his homework the whole time. And it became a huge hit. It got millions and millions of views. And it's funny, it still makes me laugh today. And that was the first time I really realized that we could have hits uh, with short video, with just a few minutes of uh, videos generated by regular people living their lives, sharing with the world their, their experiences. That's wonderful. All right, so we have Prifti, uh, I'm not gonna say your last name, Vijay Krishnan uh, from Bombay. Yeah. In yeah. Go ahead, what's your question? Um, Hello. So, um, what is your favorite type of YouTube video? Hmm. Well, I like lots of types of YouTube videos, and um, we're blessed at YouTube that we have so many different types of, of videos. We have, of course, highlight videos. We have, um, um, we have parody videos. We have learning videos. Uh, we have a lot of people who are uh, just sharing from their lives, user-generated videos. Um, but I'd say probably what I'm most proud about at YouTube is the fact that we have a lot of learning videos. And people tell me how they've been able to change their lives by learning so much material on YouTube that otherwise they never would have had. And I think about YouTube as a, um, a giant video library that has any information you want to learn about anything in the world. And that is a free resource for anyone to improve their life or to learn something new. And that's one of the areas of YouTube I'm really proud of. We also have a ton of entertainment, as you know, and music videos and humor videos. So uh, all parts are important. And it's the combination of all these parts that make YouTube the special place that it is. Uh, and Kofi from Ghana has, I think, a related question. Yeah. Yeah. My question is that Hi. what learning videos do you or your kids like to watch on YouTube? Which, which what did you say? What learning videos do you or your kids like to watch on YouTube? Um... I can't, I couldn't quite hear the question. I heard what, something. What, which what, something do you and your... Learn, what learning videos do you yourself watch? Oh, which learning videos do we oh, like? Um, well, probably my favorite learning videos to watch on YouTube are when my kids ask me a question and I don't know the answer. And that actually happens a lot. Uh, where they get stuck, they need help with math or physics or some kind of science and I can't explain it. So I just say, hey, why don't you go to YouTube and look it up there? I'm sure they're many videos that explain that. And usually, almost always, there, there are many choices from that. So that's one uh, area that's important. I also say there's a lot of nice exercise videos on YouTube. So whether you're interested in yoga or fitness, um, especially when people are in quarantine, there are a lot of great programs that we can do to just do exercise in our house. And those are really important, especially right now. But thank you for your question. And I'm glad to see such an international audience here. Yeah, I bet you didn't expect you'd be speaking to people from no. Africa, India, uh, at the late time of their night right now. Yeah, no, from every continent here. So it's great to see that. So from Virginia, Layla has a question in the United okay. States. What are you excited about in terms of future directions of YouTube? Mm, um, many, many things with YouTube that I'm excited about for the future. So I'm excited about certainly enabling the next generation of creators. Um, so we probably have lots of people here on the call that at some point will be a creator on YouTube. And so we're excited about enabling all of you. And we think there's a lot of ways that video can continue to be developed, um, ways that we can make it um, more interactive for people. Um, I also think there are other areas that we're really just getting started with, like VR, where um, it's a, it can be really compelling, but we just don't have that many people right now who have access to VR headsets or VR content. But I think that can be really compelling in the future. And, um, and um, you know, just continuing to grow all of the YouTubers out there who have so much wonderful content to share with the world and making sure people can find it and grow it. So that's just one of some of the areas that we're invested in going forward. 
I have two questions myself, Susan. Uh, last week's episode, we talked about artificial intelligence and machine learning and how computers can recognize patterns. Uh, how does YouTube use AI and machine learning? Yes, yeah, so YouTube couldn't function without AI and machine learning because we use it in every part of, of YouTube. So first of all, we use it in the recommendations that we make. So when you come to YouTube and we need to decide which video should we show you, we use machine learning to try to figure that out in our recommendations. So YouTube has 500 hours of video uploaded every minute. And so when you come to YouTube, we need to look over literally millions and millions um, of hours and figure out what's the right video to show you. And so we use machine learning for that. Um, we also use machine learning to keep people safe on our platform. So we use it as a way of finding content that we think might not meet our policy requirements. So something that would um, be a violation, like something that would promote violence. So we use machine learning to find videos that we think would be a violation. And they, um, I think about it in terms of our machine learning casts a really big net. And then we have people who review those videos to see, is it true that they really are violating our policies? But um, also all of that is with machine learning. And of course our ads too, how do we decide which ad to serve on a video? That's also based on machine learning. So pretty much everything we do at YouTube is based on machine learning. So it's not you personally recommending the videos? To no, us? no, we have, two, we have 2 billion users. And so, and 500 hours uploaded every minute. So in order to make that match between the billions of users and the millions, and millions of videos, I mean, probably billions of videos, uh, we need to use machine learning. That's and crazy. so YouTube really only can exist because of machine learning. Every minute, 500 hours of new videos are added to YouTube oh. by people on YouTube. It's crazy. Yeah, so we need to figure it out. Is this a video everyone wants to watch? Or is this a video that is uh, a problem for our policies? And the only and we, there's no way we can do that with people. Um, we can only do that with machines. Yeah, one of the most interesting things that we talked about this last week is about how hard it is to have machines enforce policies and you have humans deciding what the policies are, but you can't have the humans themselves watching every video and how you need to basically build the technology to enforce policies. And when those policies are deciding what you can show to people or not, and uh, it, it, it's kind of a complicated issue. <laughs> and I know you're under- It is very complicated. And we, we also make sure that machines learn the right thing. So that's the other thing that happens sometimes. So we we, we give the machines a set of videos that, that are an example of the videos that are violating our policy, but we need to make sure they learn the right lessons. And if they don't, then we retrain them. So they start learning and finding the right videos. So I want to start to take a little break from questions and uh, int introduce our computer science topic of today, which is abstraction. Uh, and we're going to do a quick lesson with everybody, including Susan. So abstraction is a concept that we use yeah. all the time, not just in computer science. And it's what it basically means is taking something complicated and making it really simple. Uh, so that when you have a bunch of complicated details that you don't want to care about, you can really simplify them down. For example, you know, if, if I were to give Susan driving directions to get from my house to Sophia's school, I wouldn't start by saying, open the garage door, open the car door, get in the car, take the key out of your pocket, put the key in the ignition. I, I would just say, get out of the street and take a right turn. And you wouldn't need to say, put your hand on the steering wheel and all those little steps, because we know how to do those things. We abstract them away and just say, high level words like go on the freeway north and take exit 15. Uh, I wanna show how we can, all of us together very quickly learn similarly to basically go from really detailed steps to really simple commands using abstraction. Uh, so please follow along with me and, and uh, Susan again, if you aren't in the gallery view to see everybody's faces, uh, go into this view and we're gonna make sure everybody at home sees that. So I'm gonna give you commands to all follow along. So Everybody raise your hand up like me and Sophia. All right, now make a fist. And if you're at home, even if you're not on camera, do the same thing. All right, now stick out your thumb. All right, let's call this the number one. This isn't really how we show the number one anywhere, but let's just pretend that's how we're doing it. All right, 
Now lower your hand. That was the number one. Now do it again, pick up your hand, make a fist, stick out your pinky finger. Let's call this the number two. All right, now put your hand back down. All right, now we're gonna learn a third number. Raise up your hand, everybody. Make a fist, stick out your thumb and your pinky finger. And if you want, you can wiggle it like Sophia just did. Mm -hmm. Let's call this the number three. So we just learned a very simple language with three numbers and using abstraction, instead of giving you all those instructions, I can repeat them again. Susan, uh, did you get that complex language we just- I think so. I think so. I think I can handle that. All right, so now I'm gonna use a more high level command. I'm just gonna say using that new language, count down from three to one, as I'm gonna count out loud. So three, and then two, and then one. And what we did basically, I didn't need to say, pick up your hand, make a fist, do this and that. Once you learn what a three looks like and what a two looks like and what a one looks like, you can abstract away those details. Abstraction is so critical to computer science and generally to communication. It's what enables us to build really complicated computer programs without having to look through millions and millions and even billions of lines of code. Um, we're gonna learn more about how to do that on a computer, but I wanna finish some of our questions with Susan. Uh, and we have some questions actually from the audience. So I'm gonna introduce Leo Ortiz uh, to ask these questions for us. Akira, who usually produces Code Break and asks the audience questions, isn't here with us today. Uh, so Leo, are you there with us? Can you join us? Hi, Hadi, yes. And hi, Susan. Uh, we got hi. dozens and dozens of questions. We're gonna read a couple of them. Lily Grayson from Washington State. She asks, what challenges have you encountered getting to this stage in your career? And do you have a message from young girls in particular based on your experiences? Yeah. Well, I've definitely experienced lots of challenges. I don't think anyone who, who I don't think anyone ever has setbacks. Everybody has setbacks along the way. And I would say the message that I have for young girls is that computer science is a really valuable and important field. And I really care about that a lot because they see that we just don't have enough young girls and we don't have enough women in computer science. And um, that, that's really a problem because all of the future world that we're building is gonna need computer science. And so we wanna make sure that that's a world that's represented by everybody regardless of the backgrounds. And I'll tell you my story. Um, I, um, I never thought I'd be interested in computer science. Like I, I never ever like considered that um, when I was younger. And that was probably for many reasons. Like we didn't really have as many options at that time. But, but um, I love doing creative things. I love making art projects and um, building things and um, when I um, discovered by accident computer science, I realized that I could build things that everyone in the world could see and could use, and that I could just take a few classes, and that would enable me to do a huge amount of work in the future. And um, I was actually a senior in college when I discovered that. And I thought I was too old and it was too late for me uh, to change careers, but I decided I would just take the classes anyway. And those classes changed my life. And um, I've seen it with my own kids that, that it's really important to have it and, and to not give up. And that you know, everyone, everyone is capable of learning it. Everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, you are capable of learning it and you will need it for the future, just like you need math, just like you need reading. Like, it doesn't mean you're gonna become a mathematician because you take math. Um, it doesn't mean you're gonna be like an English professor because you learn how to read, but you do need those basic skills to do everything else in the world. And the same thing is for computer science in the world going forward. You will need it and it will open up a lot of doors. So I really encourage you all to take it and to stick with it. and. Um, and I want to again emphasize like this is something that everybody can learn everyone no matter who your background is where you are you can learn it 
In, in a related question, Danu and Ritu Shri from Dubai, they ask, do you have any advice for young people interested in the field of technology today? So my advice for people interested in the field of technology today is to, well, first of all, to have a understanding of computer science. I, that will always open up doors if you understand how technology is made. And again, you don't need to have that much. You just, because it's always changing. You just need to have a willingness to want to learn and to keep learning as technology changes. And I think the other thing that I would encourage people to do is just, um, just be curious and explore. And there are so many ways that technology is changing our world. And so it's possible that you discover some area that hasn't yet been explored by people and that you have some ideas that are new. And I, I really think that that could happen because there's just so many opportunities that are still out there. And so I would encourage you to explore and ask lots of questions and um, have fun, get together with your friends, think about projects of things that would be useful to you. you know, that's one way to think about like why you ever if you're ever doing something you're like wait why why doesn't it work this way like i really should work this other way it would be so much better like get together with your friends and think about how you could change that because because you probably could and and this is the time to do it so and 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 don't give up look if it doesn't if one idea doesn't work out just find another idea there are a million you'll find another good idea um and just keep keep at it and don't let anyone tell you that you are too young, that you couldn't do it. I'm sure you can do it. Just be persistent and keep working on it. Tinkering, creativity, and persistence are also important uh, for people studying computer science. Thank you so much for your advice, Susan, and for joining us today. And we're gonna switch to, again, to gallery view. So all the students on camera, if we could unmute everybody to wave goodbye. Uh, to Susan as we thank her. Yeah. Bye. 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 I'd like to I'd like to welcome our next special guest, actress and singer China Ann McLean. Hi, China. Oh, hello. How are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you, and I saw you earlier uh, joining us for counting one, two, three. Yeah, earlier. you saw me. Three, two, one. <laughs> yeah. um, where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Georgia. I am at my home right now. Georgia, wow. Um, yeah. And do you have any words you want to share with the students who are studying at home? And as you said, the students here from every, all, every continent and all over the world. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can see. Um, I'm just really proud of you guys. I think that it's really incredible that you're all this interested in something as extensive and awesome as computer science. I'm really proud and seeing all of your little faces on this chat, it, it really does give me a lot of hope for the future. So you guys stick with it, seriously, stick with it. Like Susan said, anyone can learn it and you guys can do it. Absolutely. Uh, one of the most important things as you saw, see from the folks here is the diversity of the faces. Uh, you know, we're in a field, the field of tech and computer science is predominantly white and it's predominantly male. Uh, and what's fantastic is watching the next generation of students who are basically representing, obviously like my daughter, Sophia, and there's so many students from all over the world. Uh, these, the young folks here are changing the face of computer science and together they're gonna help us build a bit better future. Uh, yes, they are. And go ahead, Sophia, I see you representing for the women in the field, the young women, go ahead, girl. <laughs> Oh, she's so cute. Thank you. So we want to, uh, before we go into the next part of our lesson, we want to take a break for a quick trivia question. It's trivia time. <laughs> Sophia okay. makes sound effects. So we have a question, <laughs> what was the very first smartphone? And if you don't see the poll on screen, those of you who are on YouTube live watching, uh, was the first smartphone the iPhone 1, the Palm Trio, the Simon Personal Communicator, the BlackBerry 5810 or the Pocket PC with Windows Mobile from Microsoft? There's lots of choices. China, what was your first smartphone? Oh my gosh. I, 
is it sad that I don't even remember? I don't even think it was able to take photos. <laughs> I have multiple of my first smartphones here for just this trivia question. Steffi is really embarrassed to show us how <laughs> that is. So this is uh, the iPhone. This is the iPhone one right here. Yes. This is a BlackBerry, the first BlackBerry phone that came out. And this here is a Palm phone. Uh, I actually, they actually still work. I actually used the iPhone a few days ago uh, just to test that it works. But I'm gonna share the screen. Actually, look, can we show what the, the students guessed were the results? Mm-hmm, they guessed the BlackBerry 58. Yep, so now I wanna actually do a quick screen share to show the answers. Uh, so where's my screen share? Um, thanks, Sophia. <laughs> so what you can see is the iPhone one is what a lot of people think, uh, but that actually of the list was the most recent of the smartphones, not the Palm Trio, not the Microsoft Pocket PC, not the Blackberry, but the Simon personal. Yeah. Look at this bad boy made in 1992. Uh, so 28 years ago, this was the first smartphone. So I always love learning something new with computer science tri trivia. <laughs> that is dope. I want to get me one of those. <laughs> you carry that around? I don't know if you can tweet <laughs> with it though. Uh, I don't. I didn't see if it had a full-on keyboard for using Twitter. And it didn't know. look like it did. <laughs> look at her holding that phone up. Yeah. That means you took really good care of it if they still work. Good for you. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that they still work. Um, so we're going to skip into learning our next part of today's lesson about abstraction. We're going to learn about using functions. And a function is a type of abstraction. Remember earlier when we were holding up our numbers one, two, and three, and I didn't need to repeat all the commands. I just said, show the number one, and you knew how to do it. Functions are basically the exact same thing in code. When you write a bunch of code, if you want to do the same thing over and over again, you don't need to repeat all the code you wrote earlier. You use a function to do it. And I'm gonna demo this in a game that I started building and then Sophia's gonna finish that game. And as Susan was talking about projects and tinkering and creativity, that's exactly what we're gonna do here. We're gonna tinker with a project that I already started. So what we have here is a game on code.org, just to first of all show what's happening on the screen. On the left side here is where this game is gonna be playing. On the right side here is all the code and some of this has already started. Uh, and here are the commands for all the other things we could add to the game. Um, so I'm gonna start by just looking at the code. You can see it when we run the code here, it does this thing called game setup. What does game setup mean? This is a function. And if I click, you can see all the code that is involved in game setup, but you don't need to know those details. It just says game setup. And then up here, it says when I hit the right key, move this little rabbit east. And when I hit the left key, move it west. So Sophia, we're going to hit run, and then you're going to use your mouse to click on these keys to, to control that little rabbit to move them right and left. Go. So you can click right and left, and when you hit the down button, the rabbit drops little carrots to make stew. <laughs> your rabbit is making carrot stew. So each time you do it, it also shows how much stew you've made. Right, so that's a pretty simple game. You're making carrots stew. And if you look here, here's the code that says when the down button is pressed, make a new carrot and have the carrot move south. And by the way, China, if you haven't seen code that looks like this, you can, if, usually when you see code, it looks like this. Uh, it's a whole bunch of text, but we're using blocks, which is basically the same concepts. It's just a little bit easier at a younger age. So here's the code for what happens when one of those carrots hits one of these empty pots. It plays the sound, the carrot disappears, and we change the pot into stew, and we then print something. But I want to write the code and add the code for what happens when the carrot hits this hungry rabbit. See this little brown rabbit that was going back and forth? So what should we do when the carrot hits the hungry rabbit? What do you think, China? Um, I don't know. You tell me. How about we have the hungry rabbit eat the carrot so it can't go into the stew? Does that, does that work? Oh, I guess so. I would have liked him to drink the stew, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> Standing in the way, and since it's a computer game, the hungry rabbits are bad guy. So, so Sophia, 
We want to add some code when the carrot hits the hungry rabbit. We want to make the carrot disappear. So go under sprites and remove the carrot. So don't remove the don't remove the good guy. Just take that out. You want to remove the carrot. And we learned earlier that the way to do this is by taking this sprite. You want to remove this sprite, which is the sort of the subject of this when block. So the event that that happens, we remove the carrot. We should also play a sound. Uh, so go into the world category and pick a play sound. Oh, and we get to choose what sound we want to do. Uh, so click choose and click here where it says collect. Uh, and China, I want your help choosing the sound when the when the hungry rabbit eats the carrot. So Ooh. let's try these three options: clicky, clicky crunch, <laughs> bar recharge, and then health pack. Ooh. I kind of like clicky crunch. Clicky crunch. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's choose that as the sound for when our hungry rabbit eats the carrot. Right. So now the carrot disappears, but there's some other stuff we can do as well. We want to basically lose the lives. If you look at the top of the screen, it says lives three. We want to lose lives each time the hungry rabbit catches our carrot. So to reduce lives, lives is a variable, which we learned about a few weeks ago. Go under the variables category and see where it says change I by one. No, not, not that one. Um, change I by one. That'll change our variable. And we want to change the Enter for lives. So instead of changing I, change lives. No, nope, not still. <laughs> lives. And you don't want to increase the number of lives, you want to decrease them. So instead of changing them by one, we want to change them by negative one. All right. And, and now you can also print the number of lives you have left. There's a print block here. And if you hit Command C, Command V, you can make a copy of that block. That's going to print out how many lives we have left. That's the code that prints how many stew you have, but now we can have how many lives we have left. Why don't I keep clicking the wrong one? It's okay. Wow. Change the lives. Okay. All right. So now let's run it and see how it works. All right. So now Sophia's. So Thank Sophia you. has negative 10 lives left. She made two stews and negative 10 <laughs> lives. Is there something we forgot? What does negative 10 <laughs> lives mean? <laughs> How many negative lives do you have, China? <laughs> negative lives? A lot. More than 10. What do you usually happen in a computer game when you get when you start losing too many lives and when you go past zero? What happens usually? You lose. You lose. So what we didn't do is we didn't check if we ran out of lives. And if you look at this code up here, it has this function called check if game is over. And we can actually drop, drag this block, check if game is over, and add it over here. And so wow. you, you click the edit button because that function doesn't do everything we want it to do. Right now, it says if the stew is five, <laughs> you win. So you win when you get five stews. But we want to say you would lose, you lose if you get to down to zero lives. So click this entire if thing and copy it and paste it with command C, command D. Boom. All right. And now instead of checking if the stew equals five, check if the lives equals, equals zero. lives equals zero. And right now it <laughs> says you win. Play again. China, can you tell us something else to put over there? It should unfortunately say you lose. Try again. You lose, try again. And this is sorry, so we can be kind of nice to it. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> right. I would put a smiley face too, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's also not change the sound because the the winning sound isn't too is not so great. So let's go. Uh, what sound should we put? So let's search for losing sounds. So these are a bunch of losing sounds, and I was playing with these earlier. So here's a bunch of fun losing sounds. There's the female voiceover. You lose. <laughs> which is a very aggressive <laughs> you lose. There's the eight-bit game over sound. <laughs> and then there's the crackle loss sound. Aww. So let's have a, the students do a poll to choose between those. The female you lose sound, the eight bit game over sound, and the crackle loss sound. Can we put a poll up on screen to choose? 
All right. So now all of our students. All right. So there's, oh my gosh, there's a kind of an obvious winner. And it's not mm -hmm. what I China, do you see the votes that are coming in? I do. Uh oh. All right. Almost everybody's voted. This is not what I thought we people would. <laughs> right, let's share the vote results. And it sounds like people want the female voiceover sound. You lose. You lose. <laughs> now, was that you saying that, China? That was me. Was it good? Yeah, it was pretty good. All right. Who's that sound, Sophia? Wait, almost. You lose. That's right. Um, let me close this. All right, so, and that's basically it for our little game over function. Now that we checked that the game is over, we've written that code inside here. We don't need to deal with it ever again to learn about the details. And I think our game is finished now. So hit run. I'm gonna try to lose it test our new code. Oh no. You lose. Oh. But it says sorry. It said sorry. It's kind of nice. All right, do you want to try to win, Sophia? Yeah. Just because you haven't won yet. Now All right, let's see if she can win this game. Oh. Dude. I don't know, oh. a little risky. That was risky. That's uh, risky too. You have, you have only one life left. You lose. <laughs> so one thing you can do now that we've written this game is we can share it out. So I can say, share your project. And here's a QR code. And in fact, every student, if you have a phone watching this, and China, you could do this if you want. Uh -huh. Your phone and, and use the camera. You can scan the QR code, this little code here. Uh, and you'll get a little notification on your phone. And then the code that Sophia and, and you and I wrote, it'll literally, you can click on that and you have our little game up there. Look at that face. Is that pretty cool? Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. So the sounds you chose in the app we just made is now on your phone, which is kind of cool. <laughs> um, yeah, isn't that awesome? That is uh, awesome. <laughs> that's part of the joy of creativity with computer science and coding. And for anybody who didn't have a phone because you had only one device, we're going to be emailing you that game at the end of this episode so you can actually change it and make improvements yourself. Uh, and, you know, What's exciting about computer science basically is the creativity of basically making something your own and changing it. And we have a bunch of modifications for things we want to, to, to let you add to your game. Uh, now, before we get to the next segment of the episode, we want to do a lightning round of questions with China. So you're our fifth special guest to play our lightning round game. We're going to put 60 seconds on the clock. And Sophia has an app that we made that's going to keep score. Your goal is to get through as many questions as possible. Oh, uh, goodness. Yeah. And we want quality and quantity, but we're measuring based on quantity. And our current high score was set was 14 questions answered in 60 seconds by Macklemore. It's <laughs> unlikely to do that, but you can try. So, Sophia, are you ready? Yeah. Hannah, are you ready? Yes, I am. Right, go. go. Favorite drink? Uh, Sprite. Your favorite smell? Uh, outdoors. An, activ an activity you can get easily sucked into for hours. Uh, scrolling through TikTok. Something you can eat every day. What do I eat every day? Yeah. Um, what was that? Something you can eat every day. Uh, pizza, unfortunately. Best book you've ever read. Uh, the Bible. Something you can't ever eat no matter how many people love it. I don't like onions, I'm sorry. As a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, a singer. What are, what are your feelings about pineapple on pizza? I love it. I don't get the hate. The last person you hugged not living with you? Uh, probably my friend Lauren North. Some or fan that I met. Go ahead. Something you know all the words to. Oh, no. OK. That's oh, we're out of time. What was your score? It was nine. Your score was nine. Gosh, it's, I don't even know how Macklemore got to 14. Yeah, was, I know. He was giving one word answers. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, China, do you have any last messages for our students at home? I, I know you're out of time. Do you have any closing comments you want to share with the students? Any words of inspiration? Um, I would just say that in this field or whatever field you are in, honestly, I've taken this into acting and 
and everything that I do. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Don't let anybody tell you that you cannot do something. Anytime I hear that, it's just, it makes my mind move even harder and I want it even more. So don't give up. And yeah, that, that's all I would say. That's all I would say to you guys. And I'm very, very proud of you once again. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I hope you learned a little bit of something with us today as well. So I definitely uh, did. let's switch to gallery view so all we can see all the students on screen and wave goodbye to China. Aww. Bye guys. Bye. Love you. Three, two, one. <laughs> right. Bye bye. Uh, and now we're also going to say goodbye to Sophia. She's going to be leaving as well. And we're going to be joined by my son, Darius. Darius, I'm going to shift over. And Hi. Hi, Darius. Darius is 13 and he's a slightly more advanced computer programmer. And for our last segment today, we want to talk about libraries. This is a portion of abstraction. We learned about how functions work. Uh, and libraries is something really exciting that we actually just added to code.org this week. Uh, and it's a really important concept and capability. So a library in computer science is a lot like a library in the real world. In the real world, anytime you want to get a book that you don't have, if somebody else wrote that book, you can go to the library and borrow it and then read it. In computer science, if there's code that somebody else wrote and you want to reuse that person's code, you can, use, you can basically use a library that lets you use the functions that somebody else created without having to learn how they work and all the little details, you can basically use their code as well. And to introduce this, I'm gonna invite Hannah on screen. Uh, Hannah is one of code.org's com computer science curriculum creators. She used to be a teacher herself, and then she used to help prepare other computer science teachers. And now she's one of the authors of our CS principles course, which is the most popular high school computer science course in the United States. So Hannah, uh, can you join us and show us li how libraries work? Hi, Hadi. I am happy to show our new tool. I'm super excited about this. So I'm going to share my screen now. And what you'll see is a program. And in this program, I have lots and lots and lots and lots of lines of code. But what's really cool about this code is all of this code can be contained within functions. And what's great about a library, as Hadi was saying, is I can take these functions and I can share them with somebody else. So for example, I've got this first big green block here, and this is my butterfly function. And inside of my butterfly function, I've got directions for how to draw a butterfly. And I've also got right here, another function that I'm calling to draw a part of the wings. And I'm actually gonna show you how this works. So I'm gonna call my butterfly function and if you notice up here, it takes two different parameters. So two pieces of information I have to give it. So I'm gonna say a size of 10 and let's say a pink butterfly. So oh, I did not run my program, gotta do that first. Let's try that again. Butterfly 10, pink. Okay, so there we go. So I've got a pink butterfly on the screen and you'll see right here, it draws wings and this is this bottom set and then I call another function, draw wings again, to draw these top wings at a different size. So you can see that I can reuse functions several times, just like we did in the Sprite Lab project. And I can do that all within this butterfly function. Now I have functions here for grass, I have functions for flowers and for ants and for clovers, all sorts of things to draw interesting things on my screen. But what's really fun about libraries is that it's not about what I draw on my screen, it's about what somebody else can make with my functions. So I'm gonna show you now how this works. So I'm gonna click on share, and then I'm going to click share as library. And once I click that, now I have the option to choose the functions I want to send to anybody in the world. But first I need to give it a description so they know what's in this library. So I'm gonna say, um, a collection of drawings. So can to... you send that library to us to rate, make some code using it? Absolutely. I mean, we can use all the functions. You just all wrote. right. So I'm going to choose some functions to send over to Hadi and Darius. I'm going to send the butterfly, the grass, the flower, the ant, clover, ladybug. So those are the functions that I'm going to send. 
and I'm going to click publish. And once I do that, I am going to get a special code right here. And this code I can copy and I can send it over to anybody. And I'm going to send it right now over to Hadi and Darius who are going to make something with my library. All right. Darius, are you ready to check this out? Yep. So we've already started making an app that's going to draw uh, basically an outdoor scene. And we were ready to get the, this library of code from you. Uh, so here's this app that I started. And basically the idea here, this is in design mode. Uh, the, the idea is to basically have an app where if you run it, you can choose how many clovers you want or how many flowers you want or how many butterflies. And you click the, this little pencil and it draws them for you. Uh, but right now it doesn't work. If I click it, it basically does nothing because we don't have the code to do that. We needed to add the code for drawing the clovers and flowers and butterflies. And we can only do that using the new library you made for us. So to add that, you need to go to this little gear in the upper right of the toolbox. Yep. And choose manage libraries. All right. And see where it says import library from ID? Click there. And I'll hit command V to enter the code that Hannah gave us. And now when you hit add, that's going to add the library of all the functions that Hannah has made. She wrote those functions and they were on her computer, but now we can actually access them. So we're here in App Lab in code mode and you can see there's all these different categories of all the commands inside App Lab. But if I click under functions, look at that. There's six new functions. These blocks didn't exist before. We just added these blocks to App Lab they're the code that Hannah wrote, and now we can use them in our project to do anything we want with them. Well, isn't that pretty cool? What about the functions inside the functions? Those, like, those still work. Well, that's cool. Um, which means also, but anything you create as code, you can share as the library. Somebody can use it in their code. They can use that to make an even bigger library. And that's how so much of computer science works. Not everybody creates everything from, from nothing. They, they build on the work of other people. So now if you look at this code that we have right now, uh, I've already started up here. Basically, it has the, this is what happens when the draw button gets clicked. And by the way, I'm in text mode, not in block mode, uh, because we're we're getting to the near the end of code break and we want to teach kids more advanced coding. So when the draw button is clicked, here it uses the outdoor scene grass command. The grass command came from the library that Hannah wrote, and then to draw the clovers. It uses a for loop, which is a repeat counting from zero up to the number of input one. Get number of input one tells us the value of this little slider here. If you look here, it says ID colon input one. That tells us that that's input one. And then what it does is lifts up the pen, goes to a random location, and points in a random direction, and calls the outdoor scene clover. So now what we want to do, Darius, is to have you draw the flowers and the butterflies. And you can copy the code up here. So what I would suggest is basically copying and pasting the code to draw the clovers and to change them to draw the flowers. So instead of counting from zero to input one, how do you know how many flowers we have? It's input two, and I'm assuming this is input three, yeah. All right, so change that to input two. And then you have that code to move you to a random direction and so on. And now instead of drawing a clover, take out the command that draws a clover and instead add the command for a flower. Yeah. There you go. And now you can see for your flower, you need to add a size and a, and a color and a number of petals. So what size do you want it to be for the flower? Uh, probably a random number because you know not all flowers have the same size. Okay, so how big do you want it to be from two? Two, two, eight. You want to make them even bigger, maybe? No. Okay, and then what color should we make for our, for our flower? Uh, why don't we Why don't we have the audience choose the color? Can we put up a poll on the screen with some, some different color options? So orange, pink, gold flowers, aqua flowers. I wonder what people are going to choose. You know, I would have thought that people would choose gold as their favorite color. But there aren't that many gold flowers in the real world, are there? <laughs> All right. Can we share the poll results? All right. The majority want aqua flowers. All right. So for our color there, we need to type aqua. 
And Darius, can you explain why you put the little quotes for the aqua? Because if you don't have the quotes, it's the computer sees aqua as a variable, which will mess everything up. Yeah, it would think that it's a variable. You want to pass the value aqua, not the name of a variable called aqua. Yeah. And then petals is how many petals do you want? Oh. You want to just put in five, have all our flowers? Random number. Okay, you have different shapes and sizes. Um, I want some flowers to have lots of petals. I'm going to do four to 12. 12 petal flowers. All right, so now let's run the code for this and see how it works. So add some clovers and flowers. The butterflies do nothing right now, so. So it draws the grass, it draws the clovers, and look at this, we drew a whole bunch of flowers. So let's also real quickly add the butterflies. But one thing I want to point out is, you know this code here that we copied each time, moving the pen and so on? If we copy this every single time, it's basically repeating all of these same details over and over and over. Can you think of what we could do to not avoid repeating the same details in code using abstraction? We could store the store it in a function like yeah, we could put that code in a function. So let's make a new function for just that code. It's called my function, and then take that code that yeah. What do you want to I call it instead? Call it move random. So it moves you to a random location. Yeah. All right. So copy that code that moves you to to a random location. You're hitting Command C, Command V. All right, so this is our function that moves us to a random location. So everywhere else where we did that, we don't need to do all this, all the, those three lines of code. Those same three lines of code everywhere else that we see them, we can instead just call your one new function, move random. So this is just like we were teaching you how the number one looks like this or how the number two looks like this. If you may later want to say show the number three, you don't say move up your hand and stick out your thumb and stick out your pinky, you just say show the number three. That's basically what we're doing here. Instead of having to repeatedly say pen up, move to a random this, move to a random that. So one thing I also want to show is you can even hide this function. All these details, you can click here to hide it and just not even worry about it. it that code basically does what it does and we're going to use it from now on. So now let's add finally the, the code for writing the butterflies by copying the code for writing the flowers. And we have just about maybe 20 seconds left to do this. So input instead of three. getting the number from input two, we'll get it from input three. Move random. Yeah. And, and it instead, has to be for butterflies. Yeah, so bring out the code for butterflies. And every butterfly has a size. You want to pick a random okay. size again? Four to 10. That might be a bit better. All right. And what color should the butterflies be? You want to make them red or something else? We should probably use this thing I saw earlier. Oh, input there's a drop four. down there, input four. OK, so to do that, um, go under UI controls. OK. And see where it says get text. Pull that out and put that. That will get the value instead of, of ID, put input four there. That'll get the value of that drop down. So now you can run this app. Whoops. Yeah. And you can choose how many clovers you want, and how many flowers you want, and how many butterflies you want. No, and I don't want that many. And then choose a color for the butterflies. How about black or, or yellow? Definitely not green. Um, probably. How about red? All right. So now we have the grass, and then the clovers and then the flowers and then the butterflies in our scene and what, what about the like ants and ladybugs and the, the ants and the ladybugs we have a code for making those but we want to let everybody else make those we're, this, we're leaving them out. yeah we can add them later and also by the there's these buttons here to hide these controls or to show them i didn't walk through that as well the code for those is over here and they were hidden so you don't need to bother seeing those details those are also hidden in functions um, but this basically is a very simple app that lets you make your own scene. Instead of sharing this out to you right now via the phone, we want to send it to you to have you create your own additions to this using the library that Hannah shared. So you can add the ants and even the ladybugs. The ladybugs look really cool. Uh, and that's basically it in terms of the app you want to make. So what we want to do is if you haven't already signed up for our emails, go to code.org slash break. And we're going to send you this week's challenge assignment. 
and we'll do a bunch of things. First, you're going to practice learning how to use functions in a really fun Minecraft tutorial. And then as the challenge, you can either use Sprite Lab using functions to make your own game just like Sophia was doing, or you can use App Lab and take the library that Hannah made with the ants and butterflies and so on to make your own outdoor scene, or even to create your own library to share back with us. Uh, and as always, if you email us what you create, we'd like to invite you on to the next episode. And I want to say last week is our very last episode of Code Break. Next week, you mean? Sorry, next week. <laughs> next week is our very last episode because school is ending and uh, for most of you, summer is starting. Uh, and we have a really special jam-packed episode with three special guests. We're going to be joined by the inventor of Google Maps, uh, the singer and songwriter Aloe Black, and also lastly, a product manager for Microsoft's Teams, who also used to work on the Xbox. Uh, and so this should, should be a really fun episode. Uh, before we close, I want to recognize again that we're at a really historic time of unrest here, not just with the pandemic, but with the with the marches and protests that are happening here in the United States. And I know all of you students are at home are going through a difficult time, whether you're in the United States or elsewhere. Our thoughts are with you and please stay safe and please stay learning. It's the best way you can change your future and help us make a, a world, the world a better place. If you're studying alone, take a code break and we'll see you next week. Bye everybody.